Well, please be seated. And uh, please do turn to Luke 19. Uh, that was read to us, Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. Do grab your outline as well. Uh, as you know, I encourage you to take notes as uh, we follow through the message this evening. And uh, here is uh, one of the probably most familiar New Testament stories in all of the Bible. Now, if you attended Sunday school, then you were taught the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, it's a bit of a go-to story if you've been a Sunday school teacher. Uh, it's the one to pull out the bag, isn't it? And personally speaking, um, I, I love this story. I used to love this story as a kid when I was in Sunday school. Um, just, uh, just captures my imagination, just really grabbed my attention uh, as a child. So this resonates with me, I guess. Uh, hopefully it resonates with you. And uh, I, I just loved it. I loved the story. It's a fantastic story, but it's actually only recorded in Luke. None of the other Gospels record this story. It's not recorded in any of those. Only Luke tells us about this. But what's really important for Luke, and he wants us to understand this, and the danger is when we come to this passage is that we think we know what it's about when in reality we don't. But the, the, the main point of this passage is found in verse 10. Verse 10 is the most valuable and most important truth ever revealed in Scripture. This is what Jesus says. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's why Jesus came. This is why we are saved, because God is a seeker and saver of those who are lost. This is the true nature of God. God is a seeker of those who are lost and in grave danger. Now, this is important to understand because this is foundational to our understanding of the Bible and of God's divine purpose in history. In our sinfulness, in our fallenness, we do not, and in fact, we cannot seek God. We do not seek him. There would be no salvation, no forgiveness, no hope of heaven if God did not seek us. God does the seeking and the saving of those who, apart from him, would hide themselves from him. And this is what Jesus is saying here. He's telling us that he is the seeker. He is the saver of those who are lost. And the story of Zacchaeus really illustrates that to us. Because here is a man out of a massive crowd sitting in a tree and has a divine appointment with the seeking and saving Lord, who in fact spots him, names him, and then says to him, hey, I'm coming to your house. I'm coming to your house because this is the day of your salvation. And this is one of these great biblical illustrations of God's sovereign work of salvation, of God seeking not just sinners in a general or sort of vague way, but seeking sinners in a very specific and a very personal way. And this is the work of the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title which Jesus uses of himself more than any other. And it refers to him as, his, as a man, as to his humanity. But it's far more than that. It is a messianic title referring to him as the all-glorious, chosen one by God to rule and reign over the everlasting kingdom. And notice it says that the Son of Man came. And that refers to his incarnation for the purpose of seeking and uh, saving the lost. And the word seek, actually, to really understand that word, it means to pursue, it means to look for, it means to search for, and to save, it means to rescue from harm, to deliver from danger. So these are very strong ideas that Jesus is presenting to us. And what it means is this, and we might not see it like this, or we forget this, but salvation actually means this. God seeks to save people from himself. Now, you might think that's a strange thing to say. But what I mean by that is that God seeks to save people from himself, from his own wrath and holy judgment, which will come on those who have not turned to Christ. The ones that he seeks to save are identified here as lost. And we talked a little bit about this this morning. Literally, in the Greek, it means this. It is a condition of being in a permanent state of lostness. But even more than that, even being lost doesn't express the fullness of this word. It's a very, very strong word in the Greek. It means to be ruined. It means to be destroyed. 
And so the Son of Man came into this world for the purpose of pursuing, of seeking and saving those who are in a condition of being lost, those who are in a condition of ruin, those who are in a condition of destruction are, and who are heading for hell and total damnation. That's what it means to be lost. And I don't think it could be any clearer than that when Jesus tells us that's why he came. See, here's the thing. If you ever want an argument with people about, you know, um, particularly from uh, other religions, let's call them that perhaps, um, you know, when people say, well, Jesus came into the world to be a good teacher. No, he didn't. No, no, no. He did not come to be a moral leader. And he didn't come to show us what a good life looks like. No, he tells us why he came. He came into this world to rescue sinners who are doomed and lost. And that is the Christian message, isn't it? That is the gospel. Everything in the Old Testament points to that. Everything in the New Testament defines that. God sends Christ to rescue the lost from God's own wrath that will fall upon those who have not repented and turned to Christ and to preserve them and to save them and to keep them safe and unharmed in heaven's eternal joys. That is the Christian gospel. And here in Luke 19, verses 1 to 10, Jesus seeks a man who then seeks him. Now, remember, let me just orientate you where, as to where we are, because we're, uh, this, we're running up now to the final days of Jesus' life. Jesus is now heading for Jerusalem. Remember, he's leaving his ministry behind him as he is now heading to the cross, which, in fact, we've been in it for two years, but we're now in the last few days of Jesus' life here. He's about to give his life as the only acceptable sacrifice that satisfies God, the ransom price paid to God for sin. It is imminent. And so verse 1, we read, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And so here is Jesus. He came with his disciples. He's heading for Jerusalem. And not just his disciples, but all other kinds of followers sort of collected around him. They sort of came around him. There would also be pilgrims who were heading for Passover as well. So this would be a huge crowd. We get a sense of that, I think, as you read the passage. It's a big crowd. And the question that was on people's minds is, is this Jesus the Messiah? Is he going to bring the promised kingdom that the Messiah will bring? Now, they knew he had miracle power. He'd filled the whole area with his miracles over the few years. They knew he was a teacher like no other teacher. And in Jericho, Jericho, they knew that he'd raised Lazarus from the dead because just up the hill, a little way from Jericho, is Bethany. That's where Lazarus lived. And it was only a matter of weeks before that that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And the, world, and the word would have spread everywhere that this man, Jesus, he has power over death as well, as well as disease and as well as demons. So he was followed by this curious pilgrim crowd, I guess. And when he came into town, it, it was just a customary thing that when pilgrims came through your town who were heading towards Passover, uh, you would come out and you would greet them and you would welcome them and you would ask them if they needed a drink or, or anything to eat. Um, and, and that's just what you did. That, that was hospitality back then. Very big on that. It's just a normal thing you did. But in this case, because it was Jesus, the crowd was bigger coming in. And the crowd coming out of their homes would have been even greater because, you know, Jesus was the, the big attraction of the time. Jesus, everybody wanted to know, see who he is. Everybody was interested in Jesus. They were curious to know who he was. So it's a huge crowd that, that Jesus declares that he has come to seek and to save the lost. And then he gives us this magnificent example of the salvation of Zacchaeus. So really, Luke is telling us the story of Zacchaeus, but it's really the story of the purpose of God fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I think it helps us understand the saving work of God. It helps us understand salvation. Let's look at what happens. And there's three things we're going to look at this, this evening. First of all, we see that Zacchaeus experienced a divine confrontation. <clears throat> That's the first thing I think we see here. We see this divine confrontation. And we meet Zacchaeus here in verses 1 and 2. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, we need to understand that Jericho was one of the great trade centers of the north. It was, one of the it was also one of the three regional tax centers in the land of Israel. 
So this city would have had many, many tax collectors, and notice that Zacchaeus is identified as a chief tax collector. Now, as you know, because we've met a number of tax collectors before, haven't we, as we've gone through Luke, this is, in fact, number six in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke likes to tell us about a few tax collectors. This is the sixth time that Jesus has an encounter with a tax collector. And by the way, all of them are favourable. So he defies conventional wisdom and the attitude of the day that people had towards these men, because in doing so, he reminds us that, in fact, it's not a crime to be a tax collector. Now, we might want to take issue with that, but actually, it isn't a crime to be a tax collector. Sorry to sort of uh, tell you this. In fact, let me go further than that. It's a noble calling, if you do it right, because taxation is a divine institution. Jesus said, what did he say? Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. In other words, he says, pay your taxes. He did it. In fact, the Lord instituted taxation because he also institutes governments. Powers that be are ordained by God. The Lord never had a problem with those who collected tax because he never had a problem with tax as such. But the Lord does have a problem with abusive taxes, with illegitimate taxes, with corruption and dishonesty and crime and separating people from their money illegitimately by, say, physical force or cruelty. And that's what the tax collectors did in the ancient world. Now, in order to have a tax franchise, you had to buy it from Rome. So you were a traitor. You were a traitor because from the very outset, your own people, who were being occupied by the Romans, who were seen as idolatrous and pagan, they were despised. So Rome would set a certain amount that the tax collector had to pay, and whatever else the tax collector could collect, he could keep. So it's a formula for corruption for sure, isn't it? And there were so many ways to tax, so that people had no idea what you were supposed to pay. So yes, there were fixed taxes, even a kind of sort of income tax that was uh, generally about 1% of a person's income. But beyond that, you could tax people for anything you fancied. So I had a look at this. It's amazing. So for example, you could tax everybody's commerce by taxing every wheel on their cart. Can you imagine that? <laughs> you could just have a one-wheel cart, wouldn't you? But if you did that, they'd have you because then they'd tax you for the amount of how many animals are pulling that cart. Uh, and then every product that was brought and sold, they would tax you for that as well. So, you know, they would just tax you like nothing, every which way imaginable. So, what happened was, is tax collectors became filthy rich because what they paid Rome was only a portion of what they actually collected. And so, therefore, they became despised and hated. And therefore, more importantly, they couldn't attend the synagogue. They couldn't have any social relationships with people because the people couldn't get near them because they were considered unclean and anybody who came near them, then they themselves would be seen as unclean and polluted. So the only people they could associate with were people who were also unclean. And so they were this collection of people. Remember, we often read about the tax collectors and sinners and Jesus so often met these people in his ministry, didn't he? The very people, in fact, by the way, that God loves to save. In fact, Jesus spent so much time with the so-called scum and the riffraff and uh, the tax collectors and their assaulted criminals, he was called a friend of tax collectors and sinners, wasn't he? They would have said that with such contempt that you couldn't imagine. But here's one of them. Here's one of the big ones. Here is the chief tax collector, Zacchaeus. Now, his mum and dad had good intentions for him when he was born. Do you know what the name Zacchaeus means? Let me tell you what it means, okay? It means clean, innocent, pure, and righteous. Well, nice try, parents. That didn't really work out so well, did it for you? I mean, that's not what they, that they had for their son. So he defies the intent of his parents, and he becomes unclean and guilty and impure and unrighteous. And it says he was a chief tax collector. So in other words, he was at the top of the pyramid, top of the pile, Everybody collected everything, and there were lots of tax collectors, and they all had to pay him a piece of the action. So everything came up the pyramid and landed eventually in his pocket. Everybody extorted for him. He got a piece of everybody's action, and as a result, he was rich. He was very rich. It was a combination of legitimate and illegitimate activity. And that's why the people saw him as a sinner. Verse 7, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to the, be the guest of a sinner. 
And that category is not simply a commentary on his personal life and his character. It's a statement of the category in which he belongs. He is in the category of being an outcast. He is in the category of those you don't go near because you yourself will become tarnished. He is disgusting. So this man is left to live with the rest of the scum and he was barred from any social or religious contact with the rest of the population. And life would have been pretty tragic for him. Very rich, a lot of money, and yet outside of everything that was good and noble and meaningful. Now verse 3 tells us that he was interested in Jesus. Notice, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Now he was trying to see who Jesus was. Everybody had heard about Jesus, as I said. He probably had heard that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead and had got word from the folks in the first sort of part of the crowd. They were coming into town and that Jesus was in this group, this crowd, this big crowd, and he wanted to see who Jesus was. And he's trying to see him, perfect tense. So it was an ongoing, continual effort to try and see Jesus. It wasn't say, well, have a look, oh, I can't see, and then walk away. No, he really wanted to see Jesus. And you can just sort of picture him. Do you love the way the Bible puts this in here? Why are we told he's short? It's great, isn't it? I mean, you know, don't miss this, because this is the wonder of Scripture, isn't it? Um, you know, you can imagine, can't you, there he is, this little short man, this massive crowd, you know, bobbing and weaving, jumping up and down maybe, you know, trying to just get a glimpse of Jesus, but he can't see. Now, is he curious? Well, yes, he is. But it's more than that, much more than that. He has a dissatisfied heart. He knows he's alienated from God. He knows he has no eternal life. He knows that he's overwhelmed by guilt and sin. He knows what kind of man he is. And the Holy Spirit made sure he was in the right place at the right moment for Jesus to look at him and to speak to him. Now, as I said, he had two problems. Big crowd, small, short man. The crowd was too large and he was too small. But he's determined to see Jesus. So setting aside all sense of embarrassment, and these guys would have kept themselves to themselves because they weren't going to go through near large crowds because, well, they didn't want to take the abuse and they just want, kept themselves to themselves. So kept away from people. But he sets all that to one side. He ceases to be self-protective and self-conscious as he normally would have been. And he determines that he's going to see who Jesus is. Now, we can be sure he's being prompted by the Holy Spirit here, so what's he going to do? Well, you've got to get ahead of the crowd, haven't you? So, verse 4, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tr fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Well, he did what was obvious. He, he ran on ahead, he climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus. Now, he knew the route, he knew where, what way Jesus was heading, uh, through the street, up the hill to Jerusalem. He knew the path that Jesus would take. So he ran ahead of where Jesus was, ahead of where all the crowd was, and he finds this sycamore tree. Now, let me just help you with this. What's important to know here is that it's a very low tree. So short, fat trunk, low, broad branches that a little guy could climb up easily, okay? It wasn't a huge tree that he had to try and scale. So he could get up here, and there were low branches, and so he could just sort of sit or perch himself on those branches. And that's exactly what he did. And he sits there in the tree, waiting for Jesus to arrive. And that leads us to the second point I want you to see, that Zacchaeus experienced a divine call. Now, Zacchaeus is going to get the shock of his life, isn't he? I mean, don't miss this. We know this so well and we forget this sort of stuff. In fact, he is also going to be the shock of the whole town too, isn't he? Look at verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, the place where he was sitting in the tree, the exact spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Now, I think that if that was me at that moment, I'd have fallen out of that tree. I don't know about you. I think I'd have landed on my head, been taken to hospital, and been unconverted because Jesus just kept going and left me behind. And notice he says his name. Really important. This is a reminder that the Son of Man knows who he is seeking. Zacchaeus never expected to catch the eyes of Jesus. He never ever dreamed that Jesus would know him, but he does. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Whoa. Now, the first shock would have been the eye contact. The second shock was Zacchaeus. The third one, hey, hurry, come down here. I'm going to come to your house to stay. I mean, the jolt to that poor little man's system must have been beyond description. But it was an irresistible call because, verse 6 says, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now notice Jesus says, come down immediately. 
That calls for immediate action, no delay. Why? I must stay at your house today. Now here's a really important thing. God knows who he will save, he knows when he will save, and he knows where he will save. Now we sometimes get ourselves worked up about this because we want people to come to Christ, and that's right. We have a desire and passion, but we mustn't take God out of the saving work. God knows who he will save, how he will save them, and when he will save them. It is the sovereign work of God, you see. Uh, we see this very clearly here, because, you see, that phrase, stay at your house, indicates stay overnight. And this is not a request. Zacchaeus isn't running a and b here, you know. This is a divine command. <laughs> Zacchaeus never could have anticipated anything like this, because he knew he was a defiled person. And no one considered him righteous or clean enough to come and stay at his house, to come near him, let alone stay with him, let alone eat a meal with him, which, which would be tantamount to affirmation and friendship. Yes, Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but far more than that, Jesus wanted to see Jack Zacchaeus. And so in verse 6, he hurries, he comes down, and we read that he receives him gladly. Now, it would have been the first time any righteous, clean, noble, respected person to come to his house. Now, of course they received him gladly because he was so overjoyed. Now, contrast that with the crowd in verse 7 and you understand the difference between the heart of God and the apostate first century Judaism. Notice, and when all the people saw this, they said, isn't it wonderful to see the grace of God towards a sinner? Um, no, it doesn't say that, does it? Just checking something, hang on, what version does he speak reading? All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. This is religious incorrectness, isn't it? Which I quite like. No self-respecting Jew would ever expose himself to such severe pollution by staying at the house of the chief administrator of taxation, the most corrupt of all tax collectors, and then eat a meal with him, then sleep at his house. That is absolute outrage. And then you've got to realise that there are people in the crowd who are just looking at some action on the part of Jesus, just to sort of take them to the last few steps to actually convince them that he is in fact the Messiah. But instead, Jesus does something that would literally undo all the previous ideas that he would be the Messiah by defiling himself in this way. It's just against the grain of everything that was part of their religious thinking. Jesus, you can't do this. But Jesus goes to his house because he seeks to save this lost man. He's on a divine mission, established by divine sovereign grace and a divine timetable. He knows exactly who Zacchaeus is, though he's never met him. He knows his name, though he's never heard it. And Zacchaeus has an appointment with salvation. And so he welcomes him gladly. What a contrast. And when the people saw it, they began to grumble all the way to the end. They're holding on to their vile, damning, self-righteous religion, which Jesus is saving sinners who have no merit, nothing to commend them to him. And that's a reminder of the purposes of God, isn't it? Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he says this in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 29. Brothers think, of, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. That's what God does. The saving initiative has always majored on the outcasts and lowly people. The people who know they need Jesus. They're the ones who in their destitution or in their desperation, in their alienation, have the least to hold on to and seem to be the most eager to be delivered from the horrors of their situation. And this tax collector was one of those. On the surface, he had everything, money, wealth, position, loads of power. He told people what he wanted them to do. And yet, actually, in his heart, there was nothing that satisfied him. And you know, there are many people like that today, aren't there? You know, the rich and famous that we all seem to want to worship and idolise. And yet, interestingly, when you seem to cut through some of the things or something goes wrong in their life, you begin to see actually they're in their hearts are not satisfied. 
And we know, don't we, as Christians, that it is only Christ that can satisfy the heart. And that was the case with Zacchaeus. He had everything, but nothing in his heart to satisfy him. And so at this point, the curtain goes down on that day. This is the end of day one at this point. It runs on, but read how it is. This is the end of day one, because now Jesus has gone to Zacchaeus' house. Now what happens? Well, thirdly, we see Zacchaeus experience a divine conversion. So the curtain rises on scene two. That's what happens. There is a split here. It runs like this. Luke often writes like this, but as you read it through, and you have to sort of almost read back a little bit, you see day one, Jesus pulls him down from the tree. He stays overnight. And so we now, as it were, come to scene two in verse eight. Here we are. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, therefore, something as dramatic has happened, isn't it? See, you've got a man who is in effect like a professional thief, extortionist, who has now become an instant philanthropist. You've got a man who spent his whole life taking and now he wants to give stuff away. You've got a man who is defined by selfish, selfishness, now acting in unselfish ways. Something dramatic has happened here, hasn't it? And by the way, there's nothing of the conversation that Jesus has with him. And that is the genius of the Holy Spirit, because there is no verses between, no verses between seven and eight, is there? I know that's an obvious thing, because seven comes after eight. Uh, sorry, eight. No, eight comes after seven. <laughs> Mass was never, I didn't get many results anyway. But, uh, but you see, there's not this bit in there, is there? You, you think, where's the hidden bit, bit of the text? It's not there, is it? Because it doesn't say that Jesus got to the house and Jesus preached to him concerning repentance and kingdom of God and how to enter into the kingdom by faith. It doesn't say any of that. It doesn't say about Jesus confronting him with sin. It doesn't tell us what the conversation was. Uh, but it doesn't need to, does it? We know what the conversation was. We've been studying the Gospel of Luke to know that these type of conversations that Jesus had about repentance and about the kingdom of God and about salvation and about eternal life and about believing on him, we know he has these conversations with people that he's going to save. Obviously, what Jesus did was recognise the conviction of sin in Zacchaeus' heart, the emptiness, the, the, the isolation, the lostness. He is the one, he is one of the lost which he seeks. And so Jesus talks to him about forgiveness and repentance and about the kingdom, and by the power of God, Zacchaeus embraces it. That's obvious. You say, why? Well, because of verse 9. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus always knows when salvation is going to come. Now, we might not always know, but Jesus knows. Today salvation has come to this house. And by the way, there's a great encouragement for you. If you're sharing your faith, which I hope you are, and you're praying for people who you've spent maybe years doing that, one of the wonderful sovereign works of God is when God suddenly steps in and he saves them. And you're like, whoa, I wasn't ready for that, God. I had a bit of a plan in my mind how you'd do it. And I'd be there and there'd be lots of singing going on at that point and they'd come through on their knees in repentance and faith, you know, tears. No, it's always the sovereign saving work of God, isn't it? Today, salvation has come to this house. There's no discussion of the gospel. There's no discussion of the reaction of Zacchaeus. Why? Well, because there's an emphasis being made here that Luke, by the Holy Spirit, guiding his writing, wants us to understand. We can assume the gospel as Jesus jumps right into the evidence of the transformation of this guy's life. And that's what the gospel does. So keep that in your mind, and we'll go back to verse 8 with that in view. Notice, but Zacchaeus stood up. Now, it really means that he took a stand. He set himself with a fixed attitude. That's the sort of idea here. And then Zacchaeus makes this confession and said to the Lord, well, that's where he makes his formal stand, and he says to the Lord, look, Lord, he says. Well, that's it right there. He is confessing Jesus as Lord. Now, this is foundational. This isn't something that comes later. Listen, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you are saved. I said this morning, Romans 10, 9 and, uh, 9 and 10, isn't it? Here and now, says Zacchaeus, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Now this is just a way for us to understand. It speaks here of the dramatic transformation that has taken place in this man's life. First thing he says, you're my Lord. Second thing he says, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. Well, that is a massive change, isn't it? This is self-denial. 
This is, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He has affirmed that Jesus is his Lord, and he says immediately, hey, look, I'm going to give half of everything I possess to the poor. Now, here's the thing. He possessed a lot, didn't he? Oh, he had a lot of stuff. Remember back in verse 2? He was wealthy. He was really, really rich. In one day, he was so totally transformed that he went from being a thief to a benefactor. He went from being selfish to unselfish, that he went from being a taker to being a giver. Oh, it's absolutely stunning, isn't it? Don't ever think the gospel can't change someone's life. Here's very important to understand. True conversion results in a transformation that hits at the very core of, the, of your dominant category of sin. Now, hear what I'm saying. Now, you can pick a lot of categories. For this guy, it was money and extortion, wasn't it? For somebody else, it might be something else. But when true conversion comes and real transformation comes, it strikes a death blow at the core category of one sinfulness. So he says, I'm going to give half of it away to the poor. Now, half of his accumulated huge wealth. And these would be poor who had paid taxes, uh, and from some of them he'd extorted um, more than was just. He says, I'm going to give half back to the poor. I mean, it's amazing. But he's still got half left, isn't he? But he hasn't finished yet. What about the other half? Well, verse 8, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Well, that's amazing. He says, anybody that I've defrauded, I'll pay back four times as much. Now, how many people would that be? Could be hundreds, couldn't it? Could be thousands, who knows? Just play that scene out in your mind. Now listen, this isn't a parable that Jesus is telling. This is a real man, this is real deal, this is history, this has taken place, this is a real person. You can imagine, just how many weeks do you think? Can you imagine the queues all around the block queuing up to his house? I mean, who knows? And what they're getting back is they are getting back fourfold, 400%. Now you have to ask, well, where did he get that idea from? Well, did he just pick that out of the air? Well, no, he didn't. He would know his Old Testament. He was a Jew, remember? So Numbers 5, verses 5 to 7 says this, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, When a man or woman wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord, that person is guilty and must confess the sin he has committed. He must make full restitution for his wrong, add one-fifth to it and give it all to the person he has wronged. So this was pretty much the Jewish standard, 20%, one-fifth, would have been what was necessary in restitution. So, you stole something from somebody, or you defrauded somebody, you gave them back plus 20%, which would cover something of maybe the lost interest that, that would have been gained by whatever it was that you stole. Now, that would typically be what Judaism would honour. So, he could have said, hey, look, I'll tell you what, I'll follow the Old Testament instructions in, in numbers, and I'll give back everything I've taken plus one-fifth. And he'd be right on target with that, wouldn't he? Or he could have done it another way. He could have based it on Exodus 22. In Exodus 22, if you read the first seven verses, I'm not going to quote them to you, but you will find that in the case of an ordinary robbery, which was what he was doing, you had to pay back double. So he could have said, you know what? I'll pay back double. And that would be more generous than 20%. I think if my maths is right. Now you've gone to 200%. That's pretty good, isn't it? So why did he say fourfold? Well, because in Exodus 22, verse 1, if you robbed someone with violence and destruction, a fourfold response was required. And that's what he thought he had done. So he went to the absolute maximum. He said, I've done this violently. I've done it destructively. I will gladly pay back the maximum. Now, he knew his Old Testament law, and this is evidence of the transformation. It's not a sort of... Oh, is that what I'm supposed to do? Okay, well, how little can I get away with? How little can I obey and still be considered a Christian? Um, how close can I walk to the edge just to get away with this? It's, look, just show me the maximum demonstration of obedience. That's what I want to do. Now, this is the real deal, folks, isn't it? He was determined to do more than 
was asked, more than the law required. There wasn't any law that said half of anything you have to give to the poor. He would have probably given more, but he needed to keep half back because he was going to give 400% of what he had defrauded people to the maximum of the Old Testament allowance. Now, this is the kind of obedience that marks a person who has denied himself and taken up his cross and followed Christ and doesn't live on the minimal, but lives at the maximum level of obedience. This is truly conversion. This is truly transformation. He strips himself of everything he has, even his honest gain. Well, what does that tell us? Here is a transformed heart, right? Let me ask you a question. How long does it take for a person who is genuinely saved to get his act together? How about the same day? Because you're a new creation, aren't you? Now, there may be consequences that need to be sorted out. I mean, he didn't pay back everybody that same day. It would have taken some time to sort out. But if you're a new creation, you're a new creation, aren't you? And the same day, he stands up and he says, oh, I get it. Lord, you're Lord, and I deny, deny myself, and, I, and all that I possess, I want to go to the extreme of obedience, and that's where I want to live my life. This is transformation that is stunning and staggering. The revelation of a totally transformed heart. What a dramatic day. So verse 9, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. And salvation can refer to Jesus himself. You can read it that way. Salvation in Christ came to his house, came to him. The proof, transformation. Salvation in a moment turned a greedy man into a gracious, generous man. And Jesus says, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Now, what does that mean? He was the son of Abraham before Jesus showed up, wasn't he? Because he was a Jew. Well, yes, physically, genetically, by heritage, by race, this man is a son of Abraham. But here's the thing, this man is now a true son of Abraham. See, he is a Jew, yes, outwardly, but he is now one, if I can put it like this, inwardly. It's about the heart. Here is a true son of Abraham. Because Abraham is the father of faith, and all who put their trust in God, as Abraham put his trust in God, then in a sense are children of Abraham. So if you're a follower of Christ, in a sense you're a child of Abraham. Abraham was a man of faith. Look at Galatians 3, verse 6, to help you understand this. Consider Abraham, says Paul, he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That is justification by faith, imputed righteousness. Verse 7, understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. And verse 9, so those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And in fact, verse 29 makes it even clearer. Paul says... If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So among the Jews, the only true Jews, the true Israel of God, are those that know Christ. Remember the Apostle Paul? He was a child of Abraham. He was born of the Abrahamic line of the tribe of Benjamin. And he said, you know, it's all rubbish. Only Christ could save him. So Zacchaeus becomes a true Jew, as it were, part of the Israel of God, the Jew who was one inwardly, in other words, part of the family of God. Not just the son of Abraham by race, but the son of Abraham by faith in that he followed the same pattern of Abraham's faith. And that day he was justified. He was lost, he was saved, he was delivered from sin and death and hell. The Lord sought him. The Lord convicted him of sin. The Lord proclaimed to him the truth. The Lord opened up his heart to believe and repent. And a miracle came of salvation and transformed his life. And the transformation was massive, wasn't it? And therefore, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Here's the example of what Jesus does. And in the Middle Eastern mind, to include this man in the community of salvation was absolutely outrageous. But you know, for us, it is the most magnificent expression of, redeeming, of the redeeming grace and love of God, isn't it? Jesus came to seek and save sinners and to totally transform them. That's why he came. And you know, we're all in the same state that this man was in spiritually dead, 
slaves of sin, full of guilt, living in isolation, alienation, ignorance, darkness. We need a prophet from God to come and tell us the truth. We need a priest of God to come and give us access to God. We need a king to come and, and guide and protect and provide. We need a shepherd to come and feed and lead. The entire complex of humanity's needs points to the Lord Jesus Christ who makes people alive, who cleanses them, who frees them from sin, who gives them light, instruction, who is their prophet, priest, king and shepherd. See, Jesus didn't come to demonstrate a noble ethic. No, he came. He came to save people from their sin, from eternal hell, and to bring them into his everlasting kingdom and heaven. He came to give everlasting life. Let's pray together. <clears throat> And our Father, we thank you that you are the seeking God, that you pursue the sinner before the sinner could ever pursue you. We thank you that you know our names because our names are already written down in your book and they were written down before creation itself. And so, our Father, we thank you that you know us. You know those you will seek and save. That by nature you are a seeker and saver of sinners. And if we say we have come to the knowledge of Christ, if we say we have been saved, if we say we belong to you, Lord, it has to show up in the way that we live. Faith without works is dead. We have been saved to do good works. And so we pray that we'll be faithful to that. And Lord, we know it's so easy to slip from that. And so may we not be guilty of having left our first love. May the, may the fire, that initial miraculous transformation, always grow brighter and brighter until we see you face to face. And we pray all this in our Saviour's name. Amen.